Hello, this is Ken, your podcast preacher. Welcome back to my podcast, Deep Waters. This podcast is brought to you by Applied Strength Ministry, where we believe working together in our strengths is the effect of working out the will and calling of God in and through our lives. The title of this message is, Be a Disruptor. So I decided to go on a scripture overload so as to show you how they support the message and how it is that I came up with a message for anyone who may not know that the story or parable is fully supported by scripture. Please write them down, or if you are so inclined, you can stop, look them up, and then move on through the message. If that doesn't feel like you're in a canoe on choppy waters in the Atlantic Ocean in a winter storm. (laughs) But hey, you may be wired for that. I am a disruptor. Do you know that disruption follows a disruptor? Anytime you stand for what is right in evil days, in a day of evil, is a disruption to evil and his brother. When God is actively removed from a culture then the culture is inclined to become occultic. Yes, of course I'm talking to you Christians with a fat Buddha statue in your flower bed or on your porch. Yep, we have God's own people to thank. And I say this not out of sarcasm, as we are now repeating the sins that separated them from God back in their day. So it is Israel we should thank. One is compelled to ask why we write anything or helpful down if we are not the tiniest bit inclined to follow its advice, its instruction, and even its command. They scribe their mess with God. Ought we not pay some attention to how that happened? I mean, ought we not feel embarrassed at the fact that what we have sown, we have reaped, and reaped what we have sown? And yet we were told that this is how the principle works. We should be red-faced as to the whole world got to see the judgment of God fall on his yuppie puppy, his self-declared own people. Did we not know, you know, back in the days when we were more sanctified and reverent toward him, that if we declared that he is our one and only God and Father, that it comes as a two-sided coin, one of necessary correction and love, and the other in blessing. And but, are they not both blessings anyway? So how do we end up on the front lines of today's war against all things God? I mean, come on, church, you are still churching in these days when our all-out war is at our doorsteps. I know, you are saying right now, Hey Ken, we should have been making disciples that can last and remain in the faith. Yep, we should have been equipping the saints for the work of ministry. Oh, it's alright, so, but now go do it. Well, that ends this message. I want to thank my colleagues, Minister Jim Bradley and Edwards Bustamante, for having me. (laughs) No, no, no. I don't roll like that. And I know because that is not how I rolled after my motorcycle accident several years back. Now, if your names are Jim Bradley and Edwards Bustamante, just know that I totally made up those names, but they do sound a bit in role. Ah, anyways, yes, the church should have been, but we are now faced with the need for some new information. And I say new because without a doubt, because the church has agreed with the mess it has left, too many peeps logged in hundreds of TV hours than they did on like 100% of everything faith. So yes, for every hour you may have done something to develop your Christianity, you probably logged into hundreds of hours of TV or other time waster time events. Hey look, I have a favorite battleship game I play, but I still get up before 3 a.m. to get clicking for this ministry because it is truly on every heartbeat of mine that you would benefit from its existence. If not, then you should find something else that you can benefit from, or God should shut this ministry down. No, I will be found doing something for God because there is no other reason to breathe. There should be no unused tools in his toolbox. It doesn't work this way. Oh, so you didn't know, huh? (laughs) Yes, you saw it, but chose not to see it. I'll explain what it is momentarily. As you were so close to the gunfire that you mistakenly thought that you were aligned with the Allies. Abortion? Legal? But what can I do? I am but just one person. Oh, I alone thought this way? Mm Mm-mm. In other news, we have a lost-to-God governmental system in place. And how many of you voted to install it? No worries, I judge you not. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Grace alone. And but so how many of you intentionally remain in a God-stupid, spiritually ignorant stupor and plan on voting the devil back into the office, as he has perpetuated only what our inactions have allowed? So yes, For those of you who mentally asked if God actually cared about what happens to this earth and who we vote into office. 
Yes, if we can really tune into those who can declutter the political liar truth benders, then we can actually get it right sometimes. Israel rejected God and asked him for a man king, and so he first sent them Saul, who eventually rejected God. <laughs> Today we are so far off of that, we don't even care if the candidate is an authentically born-again believer. And sometimes we don't even know if they are if they say they are. Their fruit is hidden. We so much just want to believe the lies. I get hard on this type of thinking, see above, as I think it is just lazy. Yep, it's just being lazy and somehow hoping that we won't reap the fruits of that laziness. I know some of you don't think God cares about who is in office, but if this were true, then he wouldn't have given Israel a King David and then followed up that act with a King Solomon. I know some of these messages start out as if I enjoyed shaking up a jar full of hornets and then sticking my hand down inside and hoping I don't get stung. But that's not really my point. I just need to make sure I have your attention. Ouch, and I know, but you need to know that Paul Revere did not have a flock of horses behind him to evenly distribute the message of impending war. Nope. They, because of their faulty preparation for a type of war, for that type of war, were unable to see that the war had come and they were unprepared for it. Now I don't have time to be milk gentle. I may get going so fast that I'll end up burping the baby before I feed it. But no, this is a big pants stuff, because Saul, if our politicians even measured up to that before taking office, have clearly and openly rejected God that you state you believe in. Any idea as to why the Catholic Church kept their own goats? I know there may be some sheep among them. Ignorant of the Bible? I mean, think about that time regarding them, and this time regarding us. They had to rely on whatever the liars told them, even if it was a lie. Forgive the rhetoricalness. They really had no short-term solution. I say short-term because if they were anything like myself, learning a new language was all but out of the question for most of them. And so now we get to we. Yes, what of our excuses do we have? The bucket loads we have for solving the language issue? Hmm. No one to confine you to their interpretation of the Bible? No Bible access issues? Eyeglasses for the visually challenged? Audiobooks galore, including the Bible, and its plethora of translations. Bible app for phones, computers, and tablets. Well, we, as time progresses, should be seeing that things ought to be getting better, right? Then how is not the earth and all of its inhabitants ablaze with the knowledge of God? With the level of access to his word, how in the world are we not all converted? In fact, is it possible that there are fewer people that know and understand the premises of Jesus? Why he came? If he came? I mean, this is an answerable question from the TV noise from your own house. They, your kids, know Jesus to the level that you do. Bam, Billy, yitty, whap. Yep or so. They are as God knowledgeable as you are. Now, maybe it's because you are not interested in God. At which time, whether you know or care, you are simply populating hell unless your neighbor lives all out for God. I know, be nice, Ken. But you won't say that if you see me from hell. You will yell out so that all of the others who did not listen to my heart for them, why didn't you try harder, Ken? I mean, you put more effort into sinning than saving, Ken. Well, now, that may be true, but that is the incorrect use of those statistics because God remembers my sins no more. But now is the time to change your future destiny not come up with any excuses as to why you decided to remain spiritually God-ignorant. Change your mind and heart about the matter. What can you possibly lose? No, but really, what can you comparatively lose if you would just open up your heart a little to see if the whole story, and nothing but this story, his story, is true? If you are like I was, most of what you have heard about God before you looked into the matter with your own heart and mind is actually incorrect. Yes, once I started reading the Bible, the crooked road of spiritual misinformation straightened right out. Oh yes, hear me now or hear me later. Most of what you have heard is wrong. And it's this misleading God propaganda that has you convinced right now that he is not a good choice for your life. Stupid. I say just completely stubbornly stiff-necked, hard-hearted, stupid. And oh, the price to hang on to the lies that have made you and keep you impotent to the things of God. Stop yourself. I had to do the same. 
Just stop yourself and look into the matter privately to begin with and see for yourself. Just come and see. Isaiah 38, 17. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness, but you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. For you have cast all of my sins behind your back. Isaiah 43, 25, 26. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case, that you may be acquitted. Well, Ken, that's a good question. What question, Ken? We stretched out on a different path in that last paragraph. Right. I just didn't want to leave anyone behind, or to be responsible for stirring up all hell against me for maybe not trying hard enough. So the questions were, shouldn't we, as time progresses, be seeing that things on this spinning rock get better? That how is not the earth and all of its inhabitants ablazed with the knowledge of God? There's this novel, mind-bending idea that if this earth progresses, that the things we invent and come up with are supposed to make it better. But it's not so. We're bumping up against things like financial collapse, greed, corrupt politicians. Did I say climate control? Did I mention that the earth is dying and that we're helping it do so at a faster rate than we've ever done before? Are we really smarter? There's things in the past that were invented and done that we can't even figure out how to do with all of the computer power that we have on this earth. Something is amiss. Jesus was right. It's going to come to an end for every single one of us. But there's hope on the other side of that. That's what I'm trying to lead you to. But so on we go. But you know that just because the Bible says that God desires that all men, that is people, be saved, doesn't mean they all will be, right? 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4. We have a Pharaoh story discussed in Romans 9, 14, 24. And vessels that were created for or to express righteousness or dishonor. 2 Timothy 2, 20. And Satan has kids as well as God. John 8, 32, 47. And don't forget that wide is a gate that leads to destruction. And narrow is the gate and difficult is the way. And there are few who find it. Matthew 7, 13, 14. And oh, but let's not forget that in Luke 13, 23, 24, it states that there are many who are trying to get in and will be unable. And while Peter and Timothy both share how we can change our minds about how we feel about God. 1 Timothy 4, 1, 3, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through chapter 3, verse 7, and Peter chapter 2. Just look in Romans 1, 17 through verse 32 and see that although they knew God, they did what they could to shake him out of their minds. Do you see the power of sin? Are we not just so barely saved as Peter put it in 1 Peter 4.18? No, this wasn't a contest to see how many scriptures I could fit into one paragraph. But by the way, I think I have more in a single paragraph than other messages. <laughs> but no, but yeah. Wow, now that was a borderline rant, and it could be seen as a little bit disheartening, Ken. Well, it took Pearl Harbor for us to get off our self-righteous hands and respond to the evil in that day. The breadcrumbs were tossed but ignored. But now, and I want you to see it, we did respond to the enemy threat. What threat? The threat to our culture, to our freedoms, one being religion, to the very fabric of our lives. Had we lost that war, would any of us have ever seen a stake again? I know it sounds funny because I am, but really consider what we could have lost had we lost. Would we have had no billionaires, let alone any millionaires? Recreation would have been reserved only for the high official government staff. Our life as we know it would not have existed had we lost. Now this next bit is a wah wah. Now the formidable attack is from within our own country these days, as a house divided cannot stand. Matthew 12, 25. See what happens when you invite the devil into the churches and ask Jesus to stand outside its doors? Revelation 3, 20. Oh, it is a small thing to blaspheme the Holy Spirit and think that there is not an eternal consequence for you, me, or the other guy? Matthew 12, 31, 32. Why do you think the devil tells you that the Holy Spirit has been decommissioned for today's believers? 
And of course it is because we are all so well equipped as Christians that we were all over that lie and told him that he was wrong, right? Nope, we believed him, that is the devil and his peeps, and thus became amorous in a war that required fully loaded Christians to fight in it. 2 Corinthians 10.4 Strategy. What a word, right? I mean, when we think of it, we think perhaps of the military guys, or the financial guys, or the many governmental offices that strategically sling the word around, as if they actually applied its meaning to their work and purpose. But that's for another message. Point. The devil has a strategy, and from the day of his creation, has had the time to concoct a good one. You see, he has watched humanity in all of its frailness, and he sees its weaknesses better than each one of us does. Ah, no way, Ken. Yep, ah yes, every sin and following course has come because we submitted to the devil's will, not because we wanted to be more like God, Genesis 3, 5. Now, but God has a solution for humanity in our dead spirit self that will place us in a position over the authority of the devil. Ah, I know, that sounds right as rain if you have ever contended with the devil in your own powerlessness. Acts 19, 11, 20. You must be authentically born again and receive the Holy Spirit. John 3, 3 through 21. Mark 1, 8. Acts 1, 5 and 11, 16. Yes, your solutions to all of what entails life on this dirt clod rests in God. And I know that sounds funny, right? I just gave you the solution for your messed up life, and many of you will turn your head and go, no, I don't believe it. And yet there's evidence that it actually works. That's how deep a human really is. Oh no, God doesn't exist. I just popped up here magically. And when I die, all of the sins I've committed against myself, against my family and friends, my co-workers, and my God, will be forgotten. I will just disappear into nothingness. You want to talk about a fantasy? That's a good one. Hmm, what were we talking about initially? Ah, yes, that I'm a disruptor, and you can and should be as well. If I haven't disrupted your thinking about what you know about God, your condition and position to Him, and in Him, and by the end of this short tale, we have not rooted and planted the seeds down into your own spirit. In preparation... For what is to come, and God forbid it comes, but come it will, if it aligns with the will of the church and of the citizens of this, what used to be a God-fearing country, then I haven't written enough, so I'll keep writing. Now, so today we have a discombobulation of a lot of voices, and now, but for the baby Christian, they listen to all of them voices and become confused. This is why they need spiritual parents. They need to be discipled, John 8:31 and 15, 16, Matthew 28, 19. For those who are in the middle of being a spiritual father and a spiritual baby, you will be able to screen out some of the more obviously fleshly events and unrighteous decisions. You will be able to compare some spiritual things to other things and discern that they are off, and good on you for doing so. But you still need discipleship by a spiritual father, albeit it is not as spiritually noisy for you as it is for a Christian baby. And don't act a baby if you are a baby. We who are fathers started there too. Now we get to the spiritual fathers. So we've gone from baby to young men to now spiritual fathers. This is a difficult position to be in because you look back and can see the devastation of the battle. Spiritual babies stuck in the churchy daycare centers. Young men teetering back and forth between backsliding back into the world or connecting to a false father or one of many Laodicean churches today only to have their faith shipwrecked. Look, not everyone who says Jesus, Jesus, will inherit eternal life. Matthew tells us of this in the story of those guys who were healing and, well, perform miracle signs and wonders. These, that is, miracle signs and wonders, of which I believe in emphatically. Matthew 7, 21, 24. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, 
you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, he wasn't talking about building it on top of Dwayne Johnson. Now, get this. When he said this earlier in the scripture, he said, But he who does the will of my father. Now, you look at what these guys did, and you got to ask yourself the question. Isn't it the will of the father that they did miracle signs and wonders? Well, yes, it is. But it is according to his will, not according to their will. You see, they got all the magic tricks, and then those magic tricks became the focus. So they didn't really know from whom those magic tricks came from. The point of the gospel is that we learn who Jesus is, that we get to know him. That's the whole point of this. Miracle signs and wonders are just a way that we get to share the gospel in power. It is what gets the attention of us human beings. We see the magic, and then we get to hear the story. That's preaching the gospel. If we get stuck on the magic, we may be compromising our own salvation. We have his story about the false prophets and teachers, who by their great show of power can deceive even the elect. And what of the ten virgins? Fifty percent didn't make it to the wedding. That's half the peeps who thought that they were good with God. Matthew 25, 1, 13. So please allow me to change my name for just a minute so that this lead-in works. To be frank, you are more than likely not ready for the very frontline battles you now stand on. Test time. Okay, so if you can identify or pull together a list of things that you think that God has mandated to address in this country that is going on right now, then you may be somewhat ready. If you can describe Donald Trump's role in these last days without turning purple, hmm, well, you may be ready. But if you can list up things that need to change in this country and that they must because those things are listed in your Bible, and against the nature of God, to let it continue, then it's still a maybe. You see, in every year the best of us, we are all committed to die until death shows up. Then we are severely inclined to change our minds. Oh yes, just put the threat of death on your husband or your wife or kids, or other close relationships, and God becomes second. Heroes are made in movies, and but we do have some Christians who were or died heroes, or rather so connected to God that there was no visible difference between their activities here on earth and his. So Ken, if hopeless was a target, you hit it. <laughs> but no, it may very well be that we cannot stop this country from driving into the side of God's mountain. And I am told he doesn't particularly like that. But we can fight the battle that ensues. Yep, we still have God's authority to love his and our enemies. We can and should become as outspoken as any devil shouting from the fringes of hell, dangling its earthly truffles just off its edge. This is where we are found standing, Ephesians 6, 10, 14. This is where we end up in the courts of the cities and towns, states, and this very country, waiting for the Holy Spirit to tell us what, in bygone days, was forgotten, that we should speak, Matthew 10, 16, 20. Yep. These days are the days when a new kind of inventor will enter the fold and new forms of evil will abound. Romans 1.30 And you know, the law has never stopped evil from abounding. Just in case you were hoping that that's what was going to happen. Usually it's the law that's formed that causes evil to abound even greater. We've seen this in wars. Hey, if you'll tell us where the Jews are, we'll give you some bread. It's illegal for you to hide humanity but it's not illegal to trade their lives for a loaf of bread. That's much bigger than that. I could do an entire message for a year just on the law and how it has worked against humanity in many, many ways. But maybe a later date. Now, if you pray to be delivered from such a mess that by all evidences has already shown his hands, who can blame you? Spiritual babies are always drawn to their parents. Nope, this is a fight for the bride. The Joel Bride, Joel 2, 1 through 11, Revelations 19, 7. I didn't say church because she is busy being lukewarm, Revelations 3, 14, 22. But those are only some, and you know it down to the deepest parts of the marrow of your bones, that you were called to this, Jeremiah 20, 7, 9. 
Some will be sleeping in the garden, Luke 22:45. But while they do, you read your Bible. You develop your spiritual ears, eyes, and heart to hear. And see what God is doing and then do that, John 12, 40, and 14, 10. There had to be a generation that would stand in the gap, Isaiah 6, 8, 10. Israel's history is our mirror. Read Isaiah chapter 9 through chapter 10, all the way down to verse 34. And yet instead of us using it to avoid making the same mistakes they made, we turned it around and preferred a godless nation. Numbers 14, 11. I know, I know. Okay, and it's not that bad. So says the drug dealer who never runs out of clients. Two things and then I will let you go. Now, but they are really big things with subparts, so it will still take a minute. The first is that you should make your way into your Bible. There are no secrets that cannot be revealed. Matthew twenty-four thirty-five. It is today more alive with revelation than it has ever been. The hidden for centuries mysteries are being revealed. Read the William Brannan books and see how wonderful that is. It is my strong opinion that this is the only thing standing between you and a long stay in hell. And but as I have said before, there are way more qualified people, Christian peeps, who can shed the light on this, my skeleton of a story. They can flesh it in, so to speak. And I am confident in this one thing, which is, few of you will actually take the action as a majority is wrong in almost every situation. Several million Jews dying in the desert because they diligently tested God ten times. So few crossed over into the promised land who had originally received the promise. Numbers 14, 14, 33. Jonathan Kahn has continued to shed some light on some much needed light in our condition as a country that once revealed God. I know, you still do. It's the other guys who are lukewarm. And but, and but I say when this war manifests in its full power of darkness, will this distinguishing factor save you from the opportunity to prove it? Jonathan's latest book is titled The Josiah Manifesto. If you get through it and remain unconcerned for the very near future of this country, then it may already be too late for you. I would read his other books that he wrote and makes mention of in this book before succumbing to the excuse that you are but only one man, what can you do, spirit? Jesus was one man. He expects the same effort and love from you. In finishing my thoughts, and as I came across this scripture in my prepping this message, I said, hey Ken, let's end with the scripture so that the listener understands why it is necessary to become a massive institutional disruptor. Then Ken said to Ken, yep, this is a good idea. So here we are. Now, there is a lot of scripture, like no six months of teaching or more in this following scripture. So with the help, I would ask that you write down the revelation that is revealed to you. But in doing so, be sure to take a higher level view and perspective as to what is being said in this passage. It is definitely enormous, which is why Jesus can definitely be considered the disruptor of all systems, natural and spiritual. Let's be just like he was when he was disrupting the world from one end to another. Remember, listen to it as a whole story. Matthew 24. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? New York, L.A., Chicago, Dubai? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Yes, I was adding those other places, and that day is coming. Verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age. When they say age, they mean the end of the earth. There's coming a day for the end of the earth. It's not just a movie. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. Buddha, Hare Krishna, Joseph Smith, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, that you are not troubled, 
for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, as you know, we've had earthquakes since the history of the world. So we're no longer in the beginning, are we? And the threat of a third world war is looming right at our doorsteps. And that's not one that's going to be anything like the first two world wars. The weaponry we have is incredibly destructive. Verse 9, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. He's talking about us, us authentically born-again Christians. And then many will be offended. We've seen this since 2020, right? They will betray one another, and they will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. We have that happening now. And because lawlessness will abound, which it did, 2020, the love of many will grow cold. Now a point to note here is that for love to grow cold, it had to have been hot. And hot goes through a passage of lukewarm. So now we're in the lukewarm stages of the church. So the next stage is going to be the cold stage. And the cold stage is defined by an indifference by Christians to care about anything else but themselves. This is what's happening today. Maybe not in its fullness, but it is on its way, and even here right now. This includes even our love for God. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Again, he's talking about the authentically born-again Christian. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. In other words, don't worry if you have insurance on stuff. It's not going with you. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world. Until this time, no, nor ever shall be. That tells us that there's going to be some time after that tribulation, right? And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. You see, there'll still be Christians even in a time where they're persecuting us like they did in the beginning, back in the time of Jesus. Those days will come back, but don't worry. And it sounds like some kind of a nuclear bomb to me, because all flesh will be destroyed. Yes, those things will probably go off when we're all saying, hey, peace, peace, everything's fine now. We got rid of the Christians who were stirring everything up. Beware, beware, man. That's what it's going to sound like. And many of you are going to believe it because you believe it now. Verse 23, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect, the chosen of God, you see. See, I have told you beforehand. So Jesus is warning us ahead of time of what it's going to look like. Based on our human nature and our history, we could miss it. This is how we get caught up in it. So if all of a sudden one day you have miracle signs and wonders popping up all over the place, beware, you can test the spirit to see if it's really God or if it's false. But you have to be an authentically born-again Christian to pick that up or to listen to one. And if you're not saved, you won't. You'll just be entertained by the circus show happening at your neighborhood church. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Listen, when Jesus returns, there will be no guesswork. It won't be a mystery. 
And if they have a TV show called The Mystery of Where Jesus Christ Is, you know, kind of like, where is Waldo? <laughs> it's just for entertainment. Don't listen to it. In fact, don't turn your TV on. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Yep, it's going to be a sad day. It's going to be a little freaky, I think. And then they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Look at that. We just got happy. Well, some of us, right? And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Please, please, please be one of the elect. Do not show up to heaven with your spiritual resume that doesn't have anything that God wants to see. And trust me, if you show up with a stack of papers that says, look, I was a good person, I did all these things, that gospel don't fly. You will end up in the same place as all the other really, really bad guys ended up in, with your good list of things you did on this earth. Verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near. At the doors, assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, watching football games, going to work trying to get that next promotion, saving up their money and adding to their 401k. Yep, I added some more stuff there, huh? Until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Yep, trouble's coming and it will surprise many of us. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 40, Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come in, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now we know in other scriptures, if you are born again and you're paying attention, the thief cannot come in undetected. So but I think Jesus is talking about this for the many who, like his apostles who were sleeping in the garden, that when trouble came, they were completely unaware, kind of stressed out and tired, you know. Be awake, Christians. Be very awake. Verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? There you go. There's a couple of keys. You got to be faithful and you got to be wise whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, that he will make him ruler over all of his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour that he is not aware of, and will cut him in two, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now he's talking about borderline Christians and those not saved. Because someone who's not saved will not be concerned about when Jesus is coming back. But I think that there are many here, on this earth right now, who are playing the waiting game. Oh, I'll give my life to Jesus when I'm on my deathbed. Look, this is not a discussion about how long you can get away with sin before you ask Jesus into your life. You're just not going to make a good decision in that because you don't control death. I wouldn't wait not a second longer to consider becoming authentically born again and entering into a relationship with the living God, the only one that is living. There are no other gods. All that other junk is just made up by mankind trying to figure out a way 
to delay the inevitable, but the inevitable will come. Well, that's it for this message. Remember, it's not what you find wrong or disagree with regarding these messages, but what you can take away from it. Together, we can do more to impact the kingdom than if we work alone. Let's flip the script and steal, kill, and destroy the works of the enemy and create space for the light of lights to shine through into people's lives. Plant a seed and click on the like and subscribe button. Let's build this ministry together. Thanks and see you next time in deep waters.